taught him how to hit a baseball. Just like that. Set hat! How to hit a receiver. Nice. The strike zone. The net. You taught him how to hit the upper corner. Everything you need to fight the Trump administration. This is The Bill Press Show, live at youtube.com slash The Bill Press Show. California is burning, Northern California burning, uh, and a lot of fires uh, in the South as well. The entire state, it looks like. Uh, climate change doing it again. What do you say, folks? It's good to see you today on a Tuesday, October 10. It's the Bill Press Show. That's me, and you are all part of the program. Great to see you today. Thank you so much for joining us as we uh, reach out to you from our studio on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., and join you anywhere you are in this great land of ours online on YouTube, youtube.com slash the Bill Press Show on Free Speech, Free Speech TV, and, of course, uh, out in the Chicago area on the great WCPT. Uh, it is good to see you today with... Uh, Lots to talk about. It was, uh, for some people, a holiday yesterday for federal employees. So the number one federal employee went out and played a little golf with uh, Senator Lindsey Graham from South Carolina. I wonder what that was like. Lindsey Graham, who said, (laughs) basic, bragged about the fact that he got more votes in South Carolina than Donald Trump did. Uh, And didn't he say something like this guy wasn't, well, of course, when he was running for president, that this guy was not fit to be president of the United States? Uh, we ought to go back and play some of the. Uh, he uh, gave Lindsey out Graham Lindsey Graham's cell phone number right during the election. Yes, during the primary, yeah. and right. sort of asked people to call him, and it was his actual cell phone number. Uh, I think this it speaks a lot uh, that uh, Bob Corker says uh, the White House is like an adult daycare center uh, t- t- with people trying to contain. Uh, the crazy Donald Trump, and the next day, Lindsey Graham goes and plays golf with Donald Trump. Here's, here's One one is a profile in courage, and the other is <coughs> Lindsey Graham. Here's what Lindsey Graham said on Twitter. President Trump shot a 73 in windy and wet conditions. Which Why? I don't believe for a second that he shot a 73. And then he goes, how bad did he beat me? I did better in the presidential race than today on the golf course. Great fun. Great host. No! <laughs> shot a 73? Baloney. There's no way. By the way. It was no. rainy and gross and windy here yesterday. Hey, by the eh, way. no way. He owns the course. <laughs> he can claim any score he wants. Who's going to challenge him? Exactly. <laughs> All right. A ben, 73. You see, we got lots to talk about. We'll get right to it. But first... <laughs> This is the Full Court Press. Just a couple of other stories making news. Well, now, I hate this story. ESPN yesterday announced that it has suspended the host, Jamel Hill, for two weeks due to a, quote, second violation of our social media guidelines, end quote. They point to Hill on Twitter talking about the Dallas Cowboys owner, Jerry Jones, having said that any player who disrespects the flag will not play in their games. And she did not outright call for a boycott of the Dallas Cowboys, but ESPN said that that is how they read it, and they put out a statement saying that she is suspended for two weeks. Of course, the president of the United States can call for a boycott of all NFL games and 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 ask all the patrons right to leave the stadium and tell his vice president to lead the state, lead the state, which, of course, he did. It does say something about where we are as a country when she can get suspended 
yeah. for two weeks for what she says on social media, and Donald Trump gets praised for what he does on social media. When does state-controlled media begin in this country? We're not far. I mean, Sarah Huckabee Sanders said that she thinks that Jamel Hill should be fired, and the president <laughs> thinks that she should be fired. Oh, yeah. No. So, like, we're that's, not far from that. That's what they want. Yeah. Everybody else goes, Fox News stays. To the sports desk really quickly, a couple of must-win games yesterday. The Yankees won against the Indians. They tie that series 2-2. Two to two. The Nationals lo- lost to the Cubs 2-1 to one after Max Scherzer pitched a stellar game. Then they, of course, had to take him out. And then, Jamie, I'm sorry, favorite baseball team of the uh, – Sean Spicer and Jamie Benson. Oh, Boston get, stop Reds. that. Well, he is. He's a big fan, no, right? I blame Bill. I had to have a call with him. He threw me off my game. <laughs> <laughs> Red Sox lost to the Astros. They are out of the playoff contention. Yeah. Nat should not have lost that game. On your radio, on TV, and online, this is the Bill Press Show. Uh, Yes, indeed. What do you say, everybody? Good to see you today. Uh, The latest uh, on the Trump Rex Tillerson spat as as a distinguished from the Trump Bob Corker spat. Uh, But with Rex Tillerson, uh, the president saying today that uh, when Rex if uh, ask about Rex Tillerson calling him a moron, this was yesterday, (laughs) actually, uh, the president said, I guess we'll have to compare IQ tests. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to see the IQ test. Yes, number one. <laughs> uh, but number two, uh, let, maybe we should compare like adult behavior tests, right? There's no doubt that Rex Tillerson is a grown up. <clears throat> Donald Trump? Not. Hey, what do you say? Great to see you today. It is the Bill Press Show with so much to talk about, so much in the news. Uh, you are going to want to jump in as well. We'll give you that opportunity to do so. But it's great to join you on this Tuesday, October 10, looking at you online, online on YouTube, youtube.com slash The Bill Press Show. Great to see you there. And great to see you on Free Speech TV as well. And uh, joining you out in uh, Chicago on the great WCPT, the progressive voice of Chicago and in Indianapolis on Indiana Talks as well. Lots to talk about today. And again, if you want to jump in, we look forward to hearing from you, your comments on Twitter Send us your comments on Twitter, at BP Show. A great lineup today. We're going to talk with the uh, one of the heads of the Working Families Party about a living wage uh, and family paid medical leave. Also, Gabe DiBenedetti, Politico, national Politico reporter for Politico, will join us uh, the day after uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein from California announced that, yes, at the ripe age of uh, 84, she is soon to be 85, well, few months. But anyhow, when she runs for re-election, she'll be 85. She is going to run for another term as U.S. Senator from California. And Olivia Nutzi joins us also from uh, New York Magazine. Uh, Our top stories today, yes, indeed, California is burning uh, the Mitch McConnell rushing yesterday to the defense of uh, Tennessee Senator Bob Corker, defending him from Donald Trump's uh, Twitter blast. Um, Scott Pruitt and the EPA announcing, yeah, I'm doing my job protecting the environment. We're going to go back to having more coal-fired power plants. Great. And emit more uh, greenhouse gases uh, to save the planet. As we mentioned, Dianne Feinstein running for re-election. And who is the real first lady of the United States? Um, You might be surprised. Uh, (laughs) There are maybe three contenders, actually. Uh, But one of them spoke out yesterday. Where do we start? Uh, i got to start with my uh, home state from California because uh, uh, that area is very close to where we live. We live in Marin County, which is a neighboring county to Sonoma. Um, and uh, Sonoma is just a maybe 10-minute drive from where we live. Uh, and the fire started up in the upper reaches of the Napa Valley, um, threatening the vineyards aren't burning, but the, but the forest around them are burning. Up in Calistoga, that area, there are 10 people dead so far. Uh, The fires jumped over into Sonoma County, which is also great wine country. The city of Santa Rosa really uh, hammered a a Hilton Hotel, burned down there yesterday. They had to evacuate several hospitals, an entire trailer park destroyed, hundreds of homes destroyed. Um, 
We have friends in uh, Santa Rosa. I tried to reach them last night. No answer. Don't know what that means. You know, oh my could God. mean no power. Could be no house. Yeah, right. Don't know. Right in Santa Rosa. Uh, and in Marin County, where uh, our home is in Inverness, California, I uh, heard from our son yesterday that there's just raining ash from the fires in Napa and Sonoma County. So it's really, really bad. That's horrifying. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And there are additional fires down in uh, Orange County, Southern California. If you see the map of the state where the fires are, it's like north north to south. Uh, Governor Jerry Brown declaring a state of emergency yesterday, requesting federal assistance. It so happened that the vice president was in Sacramento yesterday, uh, and he spoke about the fact that uh, uh, the California fires, the federal government was standing by to provide whatever assistance they could. The federal government stands ready to provide any and all assistance to the state of California as uh, your courageous firefighters and first responders uh, confront this widening challenge. Uh, And uh, adding the hurricanes to the fires, uh, Mike Pence saying, uh, yeah, this is a challenging time here. It has been a challenging month and a half uh, for natural disasters across this country with hurricanes affecting Texas, the Gulf Coast, Florida, the Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. What the... Yeah. I don't want to go... I don't Too go bad he pa- can't figure out why. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I was gonna say, the, 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 the rest of the sentence there is, we are really experiencing the impacts of climate change. Yeah. No. That's the takeaway for me. Absolutely. Yeah. But neither he nor Donald Trump see uh, the big lesson there, right, and all of it. Jerry Brown does. Jerry Brown yesterday said... You know, that what this proves, again, is that climate change, he called it a slow-motion disaster movie. Yeah. And we're just seeing effects of it every, everywhere we look. Everywhere we look. God. Yeah. So the conditions. That's bleak. Uh, it, it totally, totally bleak. So just hope they get things under control out there. Uh, so getting things under control here, hmm, uh, not so much with uh, Bob Corker. Uh, <laughs> Bob Corker, again, as we uh, discussed uh, yesterday, those of you who were with us yesterday, uh, after President Trump accused him when he announced he was uh, not going to run for re-election, uh, President Trump accused him of uh, uh, not ha- being, uh, being a weenie, basically, not having the guts. He said he didn't have the guts t- to run again. Not only that, he begged, begged me for my endorsement. Uh, and Bob Corker said, that's just not true. Uh, the, the president called. Tried to talk him into changing his mind. He said, no, my mind is made up. I'm not going to run for election. Trump says, I'll endorse you. I'll come down and do an event for you. Um, Bob Corker said, no, thank you, Mr. President. Not going to run. So then President turns around and accuses him of being a coward and not having the guts. To which Bob Corker responded, it's too bad the White House has turned into an adult daycare center. Somebody obviously missed their shift this morning. That is a great burn, by the way. Yeah. like It, it is a great burn from a Republican. Who, who has helped carry plenty of water for the Trump administration, we should point out. Like, I don't want to give Bob Corker too much credit here, but, like, no, it, it, that's exactly what we're dealing with. It's a child. Absolutely. It is a child out of control, at the a petulant child, an egotistical, egomaniacal child. Uh, and it is true that there is a team of people, as Bob, uh, Bob Corker also said, uh, at the White House, John Kelly, H.R. McMaster, James Mattis over at the Pentagon, maybe Rex Tillerson is one of those. Sure. Uh, but three out of four of them are generals whose whole job is trying to keep Donald Trump in check, trying to contain him from doing crazy things like the uh, tweets that he's already sending out this morning, right? Uh, out of control. Um, so at any rate, Mitch McConnell came to um, Bob Corker's defense yesterday. Uh, uh, by the way, whatever you think about this, think of it this way, okay? There are 52 Republican votes in the Senate. Now, Donald Trump says he wants to get tax reform done by the end of the year. And he wants to get the Iran nuclear deal decertified by the end of the year in the Senate with Republican votes. You need a minimum of 50 votes. So if you only start with 52 You don't have a lot of room to spare, as they learned on repeal. So just think about this. Whatever you think, who's right, who's wrong here? Um, What political sense does it make to alienate any of those 52? And you know that by going after Bob Corker, 
he's not only pissing off Bob Corker, he's pissing off other Republican senators who don't like seeing one of their colleagues treated that way, know it could happen to them as well. Uh, and so I would say, you know, Donald, uh, Donald Trump's down now do 51. He's got to get 50 out of 51. It, it really is amazing at how bad he is at Why politics. Why is that smart? It's amazing at how bad he is at politics because, like, he had the opportunity to get Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, repealed, replaced, whatever their plan was going to be, right? And they didn't get it done. And they, 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 they yeah. still might come up with some half-cooked plan. But they've had multiple opportunities here to get this done, and they can't get it done. Right. And part of the reason is because he doesn't know what he's doing, and he doesn't know how to play that game. And he doesn't have any loyalty. He hasn't built up any right. loyalty to these people because he turns against and, them. And so they were so excited to move on to tax reform. Even on They his, were going to get a yeah. win on tax reform. Yeah. And look yeah. at what he's done. No, and look at what he's doing. No, it's, it, it, it's, it's just crazy. And then the worst part is um, the defenders of this, right? Uh, so here's the biggest ass kisser in the White House. Kellyanne Conway, who says, how dare, how dare Senator Corker say these kinds of things about our dear leader? I find tweets like this to be incredibly irresponsible. It adds to the insulting that uh, the mainstream media and the president's detractors, almost a year after this election, they still can't accept the election results. They're, it adds to their ability and their cover to speak about a president of the United States, the president of the United States, in ways that no president should. Give me a break. <laughs> in other words, Donald Trump can insult, can bully, can call NFL players sons of bitches, right? <laughs> yeah. He can say this guy doesn't have any guts, he's a coward. I mean, think about the insulting things he said about his cabinet members, right, even. Jeff Sessions about Rex Tillerson. You're wasting your time, Rex. Right? All of that. The president can say anything he wants. Kelly and Conway will defend it as being presidential. But if anybody dares criticize <laughs> Donald Trump, it's irresponsible. <laughs> Nobody should talk about the president of the United States that way. Oh, God. It is so hypocritical. It's so we, disgusting. We live in hell. It, it, we it, live it, in hell. Yeah. Every day is another layer of hell. I mean, just give me a freaking break, right? I mean, come on. And, and, and as It's you like put, the Melania anti-bullying thing, and she's married to the biggest bully in the country. Yeah. It just yeah. fucking sucks. It <laughs> fucking sucks to be out here it's with true. this out-of-control shit. Yeah, it's it true. does. It does. And, and I, I, I just want to agree with the point that you made, too. I mean, let's not make Bob Corker into any saint. He is one of the saner and one of the more solid Republicans. For a Republican, he's not bad, if you will. But he was also an enabler of Donald Trump. Yes. I mean, he campaigned for him. He wanted to be Secretary of State. He wanted to be a vice presidential nominee. I mean, so he helped Trump get elected. He did. Be because he was one of the... At first, it was just, just Jeff Sessions. But once it appeared that Trump was going to win, Corker was one of the first senators who got on board and campaigned for him. So, you know, in a sense... He's made his own bed. Now he's got to sleep in it. But um, still, uh, dumb, dumb, dumb. And Corker. The other thing about Corker, final word, is there's no doubt that Bob Corker is only saying publicly what every other Republican, well, I would say most other Republican senators are saying privately. Yeah. That's why none of them came out yesterday and attacked Bob Corker. None of them said it was wrong for him to say what he did. That. He's, that's what they say inside the caucus. How can we deal with this man who's out of control, who doesn't know what the hell he's doing, who doesn't belong there, who doesn't listen, who's not willing to learn, who is made, who is not made? They all thought he would make the pivot from being the crazy ass candidate to to learning how to be presidential. He has not made that pivot, as Bob Corker said. He's still running a TV show. He's, it, he is. Yeah, he is. That's it, exactly how that's, just that's like exactly the apprentice. It is. Right. And it's so funny, like, you know, Bob Corker has sort of the freeing uh, place that he's in right now where he he doesn't have to worry about reelection. So he can say whatever the hell he wants. I think John McCain sort of has the same yeah. thing. I don't think John McCain well, is going to, like, John McCain but, can sh shoot down the repeal of Obamacare because, like, what does he care? But there's another one. 
the, that, okay, so if, there's two, right? John McCain and Bob Corker, right? There's another one that Donald Trump is going after and basically alienated. Yeah. So now he's down to 50, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is not, you, you see, the way you win a vote or you win a legislative battle or you win an election is you add votes. <laughs> you don't. What? <laughs> subtract them. Uh? <laughs> yeah. I know that may be shocking, surprising to uh, Donald Trump. Yes, well, moving right along, uh, you'll be glad to know. You know, you won't be glad to know, actually. But the war is over. Yes, indeed. Mitch McConnell at a big event with uh, the administrator of EPA, Scott Pruitt. Mitch McConnell in eastern Kentucky yesterday saying the war is over. The administrator today said the war on coal was over. And I mm-hmm. think the best evidence of the war on coal being over is stopping the clean power plan. Yeah. Well, that was real enthusiastic and upbeat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, listen, for Mitch McConnell, that is enthusiastic. That's right, yeah. that, right. You know, for Mitch McConnell, at least he's standing up, you know. The once uh, a week that he comes out of his turtle shell. Yeah. <laughs> and the administrator, Scott Pruitt, right alongside of him saying, we are doing the right thing for the coal miners. Folks in this part of the country and all over the country, they want certainty. They want to know that the EPA is no longer in the business of picking winners and losers of trying to come in and use regulation to say that the war, to declare a war on a certain sector of our economy. The imagine? worst disaster you can imagine is having Scott Pruitt, uh, anti-environmental, anti-EPA, the head of the EPA. And so here's what's going on. We know that one of, actually one of the best moves that President Obama made under the EPA, through the EPA uh, and the um, EPA's ability to regulate greenhouse gases was to put limits on emissions from coal-fired power plants, existing coal-fired power plants, to clean them up, and then limits on, if they build any new coal-fired power plants, uh, how much they could uh, release in terms of greenhouse gases. Uh, Scott Pruitt is signing, I think today, an order reversing both of those, doing away with both those, saying the EPA exceeded its authority, even though the Supreme Court earlier had said the EPA has every right, in fact, the duty to regulate carbon uh, emissions. But let's, so Scott Pruitt, the war on cars, coal is over. And Donald Trump saying, remember when he talked about this, said, of course, we're going to do this because it's not fair that China is building all kinds of new coal plants and we can't. We have to be able to compete. We have to keep up. That is just a big, fat lie. Coal is not coming back. I don't care what they do. Coal's not coming back because economically it doesn't work anymore. Natural gas has taken over coal and moved coal to the sidelines. The mines are not coming back. The jobs are not coming back. Let's face it. It's renewable energy and it's natural gas. That is the, that is the, 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 the energy sources of the future. And on China, China is taking the lead. China is not building any new coal plants. They are closing down their coal-fired plants. CBS had an excellent report last night where China has now already twice the capacity of the United States with solar power, twice the capacity of the United States. They are going to be the leader in renewable energy. China, that showed one coal mine where China now has covered... That it was a field where they'd stripped it to get the coal out. They have covered that entire field with 200,000 solar panels. It's this giant solar farm. We're not doing anything like that. They already have twice the capacity of the United States. Not only that, Beijing has announced that, um, I think in about 10 years, one out of every five cars sold in China has to be electric. Wow. And they have said that they're going to phase out fossil fuel cars, I think, by maybe I don't know, 2030, 20, whatever it is. They've, they've set a date. They are leaving us in the dust on renewable energy, on wind and on solar and on electric cars, and we're going backwards. Thank you, Donald Trump. We're going Can backwards. you imagine being so deluded that you have to go out in front of the American public and make the argument that – the strength of the economy and jobs in this country is going to be built on coal. Yeah. I mean, 
<laughs> like that is delusional. It is delusional. The whole idea that anybody believes that is just crazy. The Alice in Wonderland stuff. Yeah. Right? It it's really nuts. is. It's just it's just not reality. So this raises a point which we you know, we could spend the entire two hours <laughs> this morning talking about this, but and I might do my column on it this week because I've been thinking about it. You know, the the meme is and and I I've said it myself that boy, when you look at what Donald Trump has accomplished, he's accomplished nothing. Republicans have accomplished nothing. All they got was Neil Gorsuch on the Supreme Court. I got to say, that's not really right. When you look at what they are doing systematically, turning back the clock in so many areas where they don't need congressional action. Let's talk about Paris, right? Mm. Let's talk about, okay, they didn't re officially repeal the ACA, but they, Donald Trump this week, reversed the rules on insurance having to cover contraception. They have cut the money. They're not doing any advertising at all to get people to sign up for the Affordable Care Act. So you know the numbers are going to go down. They have cut the funding for people to in the exchanges to sign up new patients for the Affordable Care Act. If you go across the board, you know, they are very systematically rolling back and, you know, we could just go on with the list, on and on. So many of the steps, moves forward that President Obama made uh, on voting rights, you know, across the board, on criminal justice reform, on sentencing reform, on enforcement of marijuana laws, on DACA. I mean, just think about it. They're, they're doing, there's a lot of damage. It is going to take us decades to recover. And, you know, it's almost like you wish that there could be a law that would say, okay, when you come into office, you can't just undo everything that the previous guy did. That's not how this works. But by the way, this, this administration, they haven't put forward one idea of their own, no. right? Neither do Republicans in Congress. It's all, let's undo everything Obama did. That's their entire program. It's so, I mean, it's, it's not even leadership. It's not even, it's, it's just petty, petty, petty nonsense. Imagine if Barack Obama, I can't keep doing this. I know. I know. I know. It's hard. But if he had, if he but had, like if he had come in and he had said, George W. Bush did it, so therefore it must be bad. Yeah. Like, there are some things, I know this is going to be a controversial statement, but there are some things that George W. Bush did that were not horrible. What George W. Bush with like AIDS in Africa and and things like that, more than any other president hey. we've ever done. But if if Barack Obama came in, it's like we're going to end that. Yeah, we're, we're gonna, but George W. Bush did that, so it's got to be bad. Why? Because George W. Bush did it only. No. Yeah, and that's no. it. Yeah, that's exactly. the entire strategy. Well, at least um, at least uh, so. There's that. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then who is the uh, well, the real first lady of the United States? Yo, please? uh oh, uh oh, I man, love this. this is a little cat fight yesterday here. So uh, Ivana Trump, who was the first Mrs. Trump, uh, appears on um, GMA yesterday morning. She has a new book out. Uh, By the way, her book is called Raising Trump, where Raising she sort Trump. of says. And takes credit for raising all of the Trump children by herself, which if you look at how stupid the Trump children are, I wouldn't necessarily run around bragging about that. Well, I, I think of it as raising Trump, meaning she sees still sees Trump as a child. <laughs> as a child. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. So Ivana says, well, come on. I, 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 since I was the first wife, I'm the real first lady. <laughs> I have the direct number to the White House, but I don't really want to call him there because Melania is there. And I don't want to cause any kind of jealousy or something like that because I'm basically first Trump wife, okay? <laughs> I'm first lady, okay? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. She is first lady. So, of course, Jane Wyman was first lady of the United States. That's right. <laughs> Not Nancy. That's right. Uh, no, no, no. But, <laughs> and, you know, that that's a kind of statement. She was sort of joking. She knew it was outrageous, the thing to say, right? Marla Maples never made the same claim, right? Or she may. Today. But anyhow, but the White House gets so upset that Melania actually issued a statement saying, no, I'm the first lady. Here's the statement. Mrs. Trump has made the White House a home for Barron and the president. She loves living in Washington, D.C. and is honored by her role as first lady 
of the United States. She plans to use her title and role to help children not to sell books. (laughs) (laughs) There is clearly no substance to this statement from an ex. This is unfortunately (laughs) only attention-seeking and self-serving noise. For the, for the I mean, first lady of the like, for Melania lady, Trump, yeah. there's a battle over this. Just forget it. Just ignore it. Right? It's, yeah. Yes, it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. I have to comment on that, right? Uh, but finally, we mentioned yesterday of Harvey Harvey Weinstein Weinstein. I still not Weinstein, sure. Weinstein Weinstein. Weinstein. Thank you. Weinstein. Has been fired uh, uh, from uh, from the Weinstein Company, of course. Because of, I say, we're talking about more than allegations right now. We're talking about evidence of sexual harassment, years of it, uh, settling with the scores of women over the years and paying them off. Uh, Disgusting behavior for which he is now paying the price. Uh, But, of course, it's okay. It's, 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 I mean, it's not okay for Harvey Weinstein. But according to the chair of the Republican National Committee, Harvey should be punished for that kind of behavior, but not Donald Trump. And it's unfair to make such out to say anything about Donald Trump, but it's okay to attack Harvey Weinstein. She tries yesterday, Rona Romney, (coughs) Romney, like Sarah Huckabee Sanders, (laughs) Rona Romney uh, McDaniel here with uh, Wolf Blitzer. It's not again. even comparable, though. I mean, I, Harvey Weinstein brought women into his hotel rooms. I mean, to say to even make that comparison is a disrespectful to the president. It he didn't dis- have eight settlements. He didn't have women no, coming he, forward saying what Har- I mean, Harvey women Weinstein who, admits who, that he did that. It, but I want to just point out, Rana, there were plenty of women who came forward and made accusations against then private citizen Donald Trump. Yeah, I think there were 20. She, there were 20. There, there were, 20, were, there were right? 20. And by the way, you don't think Donald Trump brought women into his hotel room? You don't think Donald Trump brought women into Trump Tower? I mean, come on. And I don't think Harvey Weinstein, he might have felt that way, but he certainly, we don't have him on tape bragging about assaulting, not harassment, assaulting women and grabbing them by their private parts because he's famous. Let's be very, very clear. Disgusting behavior. Harvey Weinstein, very bad guy. Steen. Take whatever it is. (laughs) Yeah, take totally. him out of public life. Total. Get total, him out, total, and, total, and 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 total. like he. This should be this should be a new standard for how sexual harassment works in this country. Yep. What they do to, to what they do to him, right? right? But let's be very very clear. Uh, he, like you said, there are no allegations of sexual assault, right? I mean, he's still horrible, horrible guy, but like. What Donald Trump has been accused of and has been caught bragging about on tape, he shouldn't, I mean, he should be in jail. Roger Ailes should have been fired. Bill O'Reilly should have been fired. Harvey Weinstein should have been fired. Donald Trump should be fired. And what Donald Trump did was worse than uh, anything that we know of. Sure. That the other three did. All right. (laughs) We got to get our juices flowing today. On the Bill Press Show this Tuesday, October 10. Uh, So, indeed, uh, a paid family leave, uh, uh, a living wage, all goals of the Working Families Party. Uh, We'll talk to Matt Hansen from the Working Families Party. Coming up next here on the Bill Press Show. Donald Trump, I think, is the most unprepared person I've ever met to be commander-in-chief. Download our podcast, search for The Bill Press Show on iTunes, and remember to rate, review, and subscribe. This is The Bill Press Show. Son, we got to talk about So they drinking. say it's a man's world? I, know. I don't want you touching alcohol until you're old enough. Well, I don't see anybody's name on it. Well, they were out doing their thing. We slowly changed all that. We changed all that! Today, women can do anything men can do. And there's one thing we're even better at.
Don't wait. Communicate. Make your emergency plan today. Peace. Look, it's those guys. What's up? What's happening today? Let's go, Pearly Whites, man. Yeah. 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 Ooh, cute. Are you good to try? I'm fine. Hey, hey, girl, hey, girl, what's up? What's the name? What's good? What's up? How many did you have? I should be fine. You should be? Sir, go and step out of the vehicle for me. Yes, sir. See ya, buddy. Today, Sean's got a hearing. We'll see how it goes. Good luck. So it turns out, buzz driving and drunk driving, they're the same thing, and it costs around $10,000. So not worth it. Same great show, new great channel. Stream live video at youtube.com slash the Bill Press Show. On a Tuesday, October 10, good to be with you today as we come to you live coast to coast from our studio on Capitol Hill here in Washington, D.C., where we're brought to you today by the United Steelworkers and their international president. As the one and only Leo Girard, uh, yeah, the United Steelworkers, North America's largest industrial union, representing over 1.2 million active and retired members. Check out their website for their good work and leadership on so many issues at usw.org. Uh, a Working Families Party uh, advisor for the Working Families Party, Matt Hansen, joining us here uh, in the studio. Hi, Matt. Good to see you this morning. Good to see you this morning. Uh, tell us about the Working Families Party. Uh, are you a national national political party? Yep. Uh, we are a national political organization and a political party uh, in over a dozen states across the country. Um, there are states where we operate as an independent uh, political party, such as New York, um, and other cities and states where we operate as an independent political organization. Um, I think folks who are who are familiar with Working Families probably best know us from our role on the Bernie Sanders campaign, helping to uh, fight to try and get him the nomination, and also for backing progressive leaders like uh, now Mayor Bill de Blasio and the Iron Stash uh, in Wisconsin against Paul Ryan. All right. One of our one of our best friends. We had yeah. him right here in studio a couple Iron months Stash, ago. Right. Right. Andy Bryce. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in studio. So do you, um, how long has the party been around? Uh, we've been around for about 20 years now uh, in places where we exist as a political party, um, such as New York. Um, it's largely in due thanks to a system called fusion voting. So uh, for folks who aren't aware of what fusion voting is, it allows you to cross endorse uh, a candidate so a third party doesn't play a spoiler effect. So uh, when and where it makes sense, we can run uh, progressive uh, third party challengers under the Working Families banner. Um, and then we can also endorse a candidate such as when uh, Barack Obama is running for president um, and even Hillary in uh, the last election, we can cross endorse them in the general election. So our votes will go to them and we don't risk playing a spoiler effect. It also Good. is important because it sends a strong message to the Democrats uh, that folks would rather vote for the progressive alternative under the Working Families banner um, than uh, just the Democratic Party by itself. And do you, uh, does the Working Families Party, did you have a candidate for president in 2016? Uh, we endorsed uh, Bernie during the primary um, and supported Hillary uh, during the general election. Didn't run your own? Did not. Right. Right. Uh, and do you have any members of Congress who are members or, I mean, elected officials who are members of the Working Families Party? Yeah. Um, so we are... I, I, I'm... We, a, pardon me. Just jump. Yeah. The reason I'm asking, I'm of the opinion that the more political parties are better. Yeah. To a certain extent. But... The fact that we're stuck with two, I just think is, come on. I mean, you know, what's yeah. wrong with the United States? We can. It's a it's a crazy system that we're uh, forced to choose between uh, uh, only two parties. Um, so what we try to do is we really like to focus on the local and state level. Um, when we've seen third parties uh, try to jump to the presidential uh, level in the past, they've sometimes played a spoiler effect. Uh, yeah, or thank just, you, Ralph Nader. <laughs> um, right. Or just, you know, frankly, uh, haven't been able to build the base of support. And so we run candidates um, and support candidates at the local level, even at the primary uh, level, 
uh, to ensure that we're working uh, folks who can rise up through the ranks. Um, something I like to point out is that uh, a few years ago, uh, when Gallup was doing their national polling, they would call and they'd say, you know, uh, are you Democrat or Republican? And if you said Democrat, that was the end of the survey. If you said Republican, they would say, are you Republican or are you Tea Party Republican? <laughs> Making a very clear distinction yeah. about the inner party dynamics. Um, obviously, the Tea Party wasn't uh, its own independent political third party. Um, it was a powerful force within the Republican Party um, and has really radicalized uh, that party in a way that I think has been detrimental to the country. Working families, we want to build uh, a stronger progressive uh, base with inside the Democrats um, and run independent third party candidates when it makes sense. It's so interesting to me. Like we've talked about this for a long time, as long as I've been around, right? Like my my very first election that I was able to vote in when I was eighteen was the Ralph Nader election, which we all know how that turned yeah. out. But there's. Now you've got guys like John Kasich who have been Republicans their whole lives. Yeah. We were talking about like maybe we can form another party outside of the Republican Party that still kind of has those same ideals, yeah. just a little bit different from what the Republican Party has become today. And you look at like the Democratic Socialists of America who are the very far left yeah. uh, of progressives of the Democratic Party and whether or not they're going to have a candidate. And like now really does seem to be the time because – Donald Trump is not a Republican. Yeah. Right? Like he has an R next to his name, but he is not a Republican. He is he's a Trump. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would actually argue that we need to uh fight to make uh the Republicans own Donald Trump. Oh, I agree yeah, with yeah. that. For I do agree yeah, with that. For decades and decades, their far right policies have finally led to the culmination of this incredibly racist, xenophobic, sexist uh president. Um and we need to make them own it. So when folks like Kasich want to step away. Uh, from the distance themselves from the uh, from Donald Trump, yeah. claim that he's not a true Republican. I think we point to his attacks on labor unions, uh, rising uh, poverty and inequality uh, in his home state, uh, and the number of policies that uh, he backed when uh, he was, uh, you know, previously in office too, um, that have led to and provided support to the forces that helped elect Donald Trump. All right. So on the Democratic side, uh, there clearly is a tension uh, between. Uh, the old-fashioned establishment yeah. kind of Democrats represented by Hillary Clinton and yep. Barack Obama and, and, some other, and, and the progressive wing of the party represented by a Keith Ellison and a Bernie Sanders and yep. an Elizabeth Warren. Uh, and th there's still a lot of resistance on the part, no matter how successful Bernie was, yeah. a lot of resistance on the part of the establishment people. I hear it all the time. Um, uh, to any to any move on the part of progressives to maybe have more representation yeah. or more power. Um, where's the Working Families Party in that equation, and where do you think the Democratic Party should be leading? Uh, so we're organizing. I mean, I think it's really important, and you know, one of the reasons that we uh, exist is you know, uh, if we're only showing up uh, right before the primary or right before the general election, we're not really able to play a role. Uh, or be a force in changing the conversation or changing the uh, debate in the country. So if we want to take power away from the establishment, put it back in the hands of the people, we need to be organizing and active 365 days a year. Um, that means that we need to be fighting to define the agenda for the Democratic Party. Um, and we need to also demonstrate uh, that when we uh, define an agenda that we're going to fight for it and that we can win for it. So, Is single payer the number one issue? Uh, it's definitely up there. It's uh, got to be one of the most important issues right now. Um, but I'd also say at a moment where, uh, you know, the Trump administration is threatening war um, and ramping up the deportation machine, uh, we can't, you know, reduce this to, you know, just one issue. We have to mm -hmm. fight uh, for a broad uh, platform and agenda. You know, when you talk about the, the state and local levels, yeah. right? Like, it's so funny because I come from uh, South Carolina, which I think you could probably categorize as fairly conservative yeah. area. <laughs> but like during the election, I talked to a lot of people who they were just like, I can't vote for Trump yeah. and I can't vote for Hillary. They just they really it really was that clear cut for them. And and they just ended up not voting. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's to me, I think, is so interesting about the election. I don't think that Donald Trump surged on any kind of um wave of racism and xenophobia or anything like that. I just think that people just weren't that excited about Hillary and they just didn't show up and vote. Yeah. And so like 
I'm reminded of when a couple weeks ago when they had the the Bernie and uh, Amy Klobuchar versus Graham Cassidy over mm-hmm. over the Graham Cassidy healthcare bill, and people were saying, "Oh no, Democrats! Yeah. Oh God, they're going to have to go out there and defend the single payer." And it's like, sure, single yeah. payer is wildly popular. Let's have that fight. Yeah, let's absolutely yeah. let's have that fight seven days out of the week. Yeah. Like people love single payer. But, Conservatives but, love single payer if you really make the case for but it. That was classic. Establishment democratic nonsense. That's the same tack that Hillary, in my judgment, yeah. that Hillary Clinton took during the campaign, saying, "Oh, how dare yeah. Bernie raise that issue because he's l- raising expectations of something you could never deliver." What do you mean this country couldn't have universal health care? Yeah. I mean, we're the richest country on the planet. Of course, we could. Yeah, it's just it, a matter of priorities. Yeah, but exactly. that's a classic established. So, in this time, they say. Oh, there they go again. They're talking about single payer. How dare you talk about a big idea? Yeah. <laughs> right. It's our job uh, as progressives and people on the left to raise expectations and to go out there uh, and then fight for them and, and win that. And fight for yep. big ideas. Fight yep. for something that, that that's really going to help working families. Yes. Right? Yep. Um, so there are some programs. Like one of the, I think, most progressive things that, that, that this government has accomplished was under Bill Clinton, the paid family... Medical Leave Act, yeah, right, huge, huge thing, and that was Bill Clinton, who's not necessarily a progressive, but yes. you know, he signed that. It's under attack these days. Yeah, so uh, what Clinton passed was the Family Medical Leave Act, and um, what we have fought for one and are continuing to defend here in the District of Columbia at the local level is uh, paid family uh, medical leave. So um, after a two to three year campaign uh, last year in December, um, we passed a program at the district council level. Um, that would provide eight weeks of uh, paid uh, maternity or paternity leave, um, six weeks of medical leave. So if uh, someone has a ailing or seriously sick uh, family member, they could take paid time off to care for that loved one. Um, and then two weeks of uh, paid leave for self-care. Um, since then, the big business uh, community and industrial lobbyists have just waged war uh, to try and roll this back. So it's our own little local version of the fight to defend Obamacare that's happened at the national level. Um, and so today, uh, after this show, I'll be headed down to the council because um, we are going to have an all-day hearing to defend paid family medical leave, uh, paid family leave here in the district, uh, District of Columbia. Um, there are five bills that have been introduced that would roll back, that would repeal and replace uh, paid family leave uh, with corporate control versions that would uh, hurt and leave families behind. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, we have to propose big ideas. Um, this was uh, this program only exists in a few forms across the country. It's one of the most progressive, ambitious models here in D.C. Uh, we have to fight for them, and then we have to defend them, and we're not going to uh, give an inch on an issue like Where's this. Where's the mayor? Uh, the mayor uh, has not been supportive um, of this issue, but last year we were able to pass it um, with a supermajority on the council um, to prevent uh, the program from being vetoed. Um, since then, though, the business community... Uh, led by uh, groups like the Chamber of Commerce, the Restaurant Association, the uh, Building Association have come out um, and tried to push these repeal and replace models, um, and we're not going to let them get away with it. Has the um, – is help, help me out here. The yeah. Clinton program, the national program, is not paid. It's not, and that's the big distinction. So uh, what Clinton passed was the Family Medical Leave Uh, Act, which said, you know, if you are a new parent, you're guaranteed to a certain number of weeks of unpaid time off. Um, That's a luxury for a lot of folks, right? And really depends on the largesse uh, of your employer. So will your employer, you know, maybe pay you to uh, have some time off or can you even afford it as a family? Um, So folks who are already struggling to make ends meet, it can leave them behind. Um, If you have the means, uh, it can be a great opportunity for you and your family. What we said here in D.C., is that we need a truly universal program that benefits everyone. Um, you know, D.C. has been going through a bit of an economic boom uh, lately, but it's also been leaving a lot of folks behind. A lot of uh, families, uh, particularly African-American families, are being displaced and pushed out of the district. Um, and we know one of the biggest factors contributing to that uh, can be a medical emergency, right? You have a medical emergency uh, or you're welcoming a uh, new baby into your family, uh, you know, you take time off, maybe you can't afford rent, and you have to move out of the district to somewhere uh, more affordable. So we're fighting for a universal program for all working families. Um, one other priority for the uh, paid uh, for the Working Families Party, I know, is um, fair elections or yes. well, public financing, I guess, right? Yeah. Uh, across the board. N- 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 across the board. Yes, across the board. So 
uh, you know, a uh, big belief of the Working Families Party is that we can't just play defense. Um, so we know that nationally, uh, democracy has been under attack. Uh, you know, uh, the Republican Party and their friends on the right have been erecting barriers to voting, making it more difficult for people to get into politics um, and making it more, uh, making it easier for uh, big right wing uh, money from the Koch brothers and the Mercers and others to flow into elections. So we're fighting for an alternative system uh, that we call fair elections that would uh, help create a more inclusive democracy. Uh, what fair elections would do um, here in the district and programs that we're supporting elsewhere in the country um, would create a small dollar public matching system. So if a candidate agrees to participate, they agreed to accepting only small dollar donations, and then we match it five to one. So my $50 donation would be matched for, with $250 for an effective $300 contribution. It's good for candidates. It means that candidates get to spend more time uh, with their voters, hearing from their constituents, and it means that uh, big moneyed interests are not controlling our uh, democracy, our debates, um, or our elections. Well, it seems that Bernie Sanders, I mean, has yeah. demonstrated that you can you can do it with yeah. small donor donations yeah. alone. Yep. What is thirty-seven million? Whatever he raised, or more than that? Yeah, I think. an incredible but, amount. I mean, uh, and I think his campaign. Was very inspiring for uh, people and helped put this uh, issue on the map for folks a lot. And that way, was but, with no matching. It was yeah. just all of his, you know, what was it? Average twenty seven dollars. Twenty seven dollars, I think. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so Bernie Sanders has demonstrated that you don't have to rely on big dollars, but we also want to level the playing field. Um, everyone who's out there who's a progressive or who's um, supporting a progressive anti-racist agenda isn't going to have the name recognition that a Bernie Sanders did, and so we want to make sure. Uh, that those folks can still compete and that we create a truly inclusive democracy. Can we ever have a fair national election while we still have the Electoral College? Uh, I would definitely like to see that go away. Um, I mean, the fact that uh, Hillary Clinton, despite how you know some folks might feel about her, won millions of votes more than uh, Donald Trump, I think should be uh, one of the greatest indi di indictments, certainly since Florida. Uh, that it's time to you know rethink and ultimately uh, move past the electoral college. I mean, we're only 17 years into this new century, and we've had two presidents, <laughs> two presidents yep. so far, that got to the White House without winning the popular vote. As, yeah. we, as we know, Donald Trump himself thinks that the, the electoral college is a bad yeah. idea. Yeah. yeah. Right? Remember, right yeah. after he I won, mean, we found sort of old, old, old tweets. I'm uh, old-fashioned about this. I think the person who gets the most votes should be the winner of the election. Yeah. I don't think the, an old-fashioned belief in democracy, I believe. It's uh, not complicated. It's, yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, finally, before we let you go, Iron Stash. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, we're going to take on Paul Ryan, he's and we're going to win. against the bad Ryan. Yeah. Tim Ryan's a good Ryan. Paul Ryan's a bad yeah. Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take on Paul Ryan, uh, and uh, we're going to win. Um, I think it's pretty clear uh, that uh, Paul Ryan is leading an agenda that's going to hurt working families across the country, um, and this is the, a great example, a great case of where we can run a progressive working – uh, working class uh, alternative uh, to challenge the Republican agenda and win uh, and send a strong message to Trump and others in Washington uh, that it's time to that uh, progressives that, will be taken That would be such a huge win. And, you know, I mean, he's a real guy. I mean, yeah. he's an iron worker, right? He's yep. he's re right on the agenda, Working Families Party, yeah. you know, and uh, – and a good candidate. Yeah. And Paul Ryan has embarrassed himself in the age of Trump. I mean, it really and truly, if yeah. there was any time to take down Paul Ryan, it's right now. Yeah. Because people sort of expected him to be this sort of moral compass for the Republican Party in the age of Trump, and he has been the exact opposite. Yep. I mean, he's right. enabled every single terrible exactly. idea and uh, bad behavior and bad policy. You name it. He's been there to help carry water and to make it happen for Trump. Yep. Right. Yeah. Uh, We've so, actually passed more bills in the House for the president and his agenda yeah, in this right. first six months of his administration yeah. than in the first six months of Obama, Clinton, and both Bushes. Uh, Iron uh, Stash should have that in a campaign yeah, act yeah. to yeah. show how bad Paul Ryan yeah. Right, he is. Yeah, he should indeed. So it is the Working Families Party, workingfamilies.org, right? Is your yep. website, workingfamilies.org. You can find out where locally you can plug in and, um, and be part of this uh, great movement. Uh, all across the country. Uh, Matt Hansen here with the D.C. Working Families Party. Thanks so much for coming by. Good Thank stuff, you so man. much. All right. Okay. Thanks, dude. We'll Thank see you. you. Thanks so Thank much. You, yeah. Appreciate it. Uh, and uh, wanted to come back with uh, one other issue we talked a little bit about yesterday, but it keeps bubbling up. And that is the big publicity stunt that Mike Pence pulled off, tried to pull off on Sunday. 
Uh, so I was on the CNN headline news yesterday uh, debating this, uh, and the question was, was this a publicity stunt or for real? There is no doubt it was a total publicity stunt. Remember, Mike Pence is in Las Vegas. He flies to Indianapolis. Before he's there, he was saying about what a great sports fan I am. What a big fan of the Colts I am. He and mother. He and mother. <laughs> and to prove it, he said, here's mother, here mother and I at a game. Here's the photo. That, that was three years ago, 2014. He hadn't been to a game since. So he shows up at the stadium, and the reporters who travel with him are uh, going to, as they always do, roll out of the vans roll into the stadium so they're there nearby, near the vice president to do their job. Yeah. And they were told by the press secretary, no, 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 you stay in the vans because uh, <laughs> we're not going to be here long. <laughs> they were told that ahead of time. He's, he didn't even stay. So he, but, and he also knew the Colts were playing the 49ers. Yeah. So what's going to happen? There are going to be some players who are going to take a knee. Right, of course they know that. They okay. kneeled on both sides, both the 49ers and the Colts. Yeah. The Colts too. I some some Colts players. Too. Yeah. Look, I mean, teams. so if you go to an NFL game, they're going to someone's going to kneel. Yeah. So he went for that explicit purpose, so he could walk out. They had the tweets already written before he walked out. They released the tweets, and then the White House releases the tweet from Donald Trump and the, I think actually a White House statement. There was a statement that was put out like. 20 minutes after the yeah. after the actual incident. Praising Mike Pence for doing this courageous thing. And Donald Trump actually said, I told him to walk out if anybody takes a knee. So he flew to Las Vegas explicitly for that purpose. Somebody said to me yesterday, well, he was on his way home to Washington. No, he wasn't. He was on his way to Los Angeles. So he flies to Indianapolis, pulls off this stunt, then flies to L.A., and they figured out that the cost of the flight alone, two flights, was $245,000, plus the people who went there ahead of time to sweep the stadium. Yeah. They had to mag everybody coming into the stadium because yeah. the vice president was there. Mag the entire, <laughs> so all of that security, plus the secret service that accompanies him, all those agents, there in Vegas, in LA, the whole thing, somebody figured out it cost a million dollars, that whole stunt. Of course it was a stunt. And Mike <laughs> Pence, so horrified that somebody would do a little protest. That's not what he said a year ago, remember? When he went to see Hamilton in New York as vice president, and he heard some boos. You know, when we arrived, we heard we heard a, a few boos, and we heard some cheers, and I nudged my kids and reminded them that's what freedom sounds like. <laughs> That's what freedom sounds like. You know what? He was right then before he became such a stooge for Donald Trump. He was right then. That's what freedom sounds like, those boos in the theater, and what he saw at the, at, at, with the Colts game uh, on Sunday. Well, he didn't see any of the game. But that little taking a knee, that's what freedom looks like, right? Yes, Mike Pence, that's what freedom looks like. Tell your kids that. Uh, the whole thing is just Good so boy, sad. Mike, right? Good boy. Good boy. Yeah. yeah. Wolf. So in other words, he had the right view about freedom before Donald Trump told him what to do. <laughs> and he said, uh, yes, dear leader, anything you want. Mm -hmm. I'll fly to Indianapolis just to do a little photo op for you. Gabe DiBenedetti, national political reporter for Politico, coming up next here on The Bill Press Show. This is The Bill Press Show. Taught him how to hit a baseball. Just like that. Hey! How to hit a receiver. Nice. The strike zone. The net. You taught him how to hit the upper corner.
everything you need to fight the Trump administration. This is The Bill Press Show, live at youtube.com slash The Bill Press Show. So who is a real first lady? Is it Melania or is it Ivana? Big fight going on over who gets the title. It's a new Miss Universe contest. <laughs> and Donald Trump owns it again. Hey, what do you say? Hello, everybody. Great to see you today. Tuesday, October 10, the Bill Press Show, Washington, D.C. is where we start out. Right alongside of you is where we end up anywhere in this great land of ours, where you happen to be joining us on YouTube, on Free Speech TV, or out in Chicago on WCPT. Great to be with you today. We got lots to talk about and uh, and a lot of political news, uh, of course, always bubbling here. Gabe De Benedetti is on top of that for Politico as their national political reporter. Uh, and uh, we got him up early this morning and brought him in the studio. Hi, Gabe. Good to see you. Great to see, great to be here. It never stops, does it? The political <laughs> news just keeps... I, you know, I kind of have just like, I don't sleep anymore. It's just, it's it's not, nonstop does not begin to describe. We used to have time off. What was, that? what was that like? Yeah, exactly. I was having this weird conversation the other day. Like, I still, in my mind, still think we're like, eh, at the beginning of summer. Yeah. You know? Totally. And like, 2015. We, yeah, right. right, right. Yeah, yeah. And like, we're in the fall. Like, this year, yeah, I, I mean, I it's, it's been yeah. a long year with the, all the new stuff, but like, it really has flown by. Do yeah. they do they have nap pods at Politico? <laughs> uh, that's just my desk. Uh, yeah, 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 right. No yeah. formal ones. <laughs> no, that's just only, reporters just blacked out on the desk. They that's just wake only up at, every couple of hours. At HuffPo. Right but even now that Ariana's gone, they might have taken the nap pods away. All right. Yeah, all right. Lots to talk about. We'll jump right into it. But first, this is the Burn. Full Court Press. Yes, indeed. Just a couple of the stories making news. The Washington Marriott Wardman Park, which I'm sure you know of. It's, a, it's an old hotel here in Washington, a historical hotel. Well, next year I they hate that hotel. Oh yeah, it's hard to get around. It's really. I don't disagree with you. I've been there before. I've actually stayed there before. Uh, but they're celebrating their 100th birthday next huh. year, and so they have said that over the years. Really? Yeah, that's right. They've been okay, around forever. I believe you, but they've been around forever. Over the years, people have taken <laughs> stuff from the hotel. For example. Ice buckets go missing. Light fixtures have gone missing. Missing, and some of these things are like towels. Oh, towels, of course. And so they're saying that if you have ever stolen something from the Marriott Wardman Park Hotel here in Washington D.C., bring it back, and they'll possibly possibly give you a free night at the hotel. As a matter of fact, if you bring back certain things, no, no, no seriously. I- I believe you, but what is it going to look like? Are we going to see like a parade of people carrying like old lamps back to the hotel? <laughs> well, they want to they yeah. want to do a thing for their hundredth anniversary next year where they can show off some of the old things from the hotel. And if you bring back things of certain value, you're entered into a lottery, and the winner will win a free two night weekend stay at the Langston Hughes Suite inside of the Wardman Tower, plus 500,000 Marriott rewards points. This sounds to me like they're secretly missing something very valuable, <laughs> and they don't want to admit it, so they're just hoping yeah. someone brings it someone back. Someone maybe brings it back. Yeah. yeah. There you go. So if, you, if you've ever taken anything from there, Bill, now's your chance to take it back. No <laughs> questions asked. I don't steal from hotels. I All have right. a, a, a lot of vices, but that's not one of them. Well, the uh, newest fight uh, on Twitter is Marsha Blackburn. She announced that she is going to be running for Bob Corker's seat. Uh, he said he's going to be retiring. She launched her campaign last week with a video where she said that she is a, quote, hardcore card-carrying conservative and even said that she, quote, fought Planned Parenthood and we stopped the sale of baby body parts Thank God, end quote. Well, Twitter decided that that line about the baby body parts violated its ad policies and took the video down. So conservatives are now thinking that Twitter is involved in some sort of censorship to Republican candidates. You know, I considered pulling this video for today's show. Yeah. I couldn't make it more than 20 seconds into it. It's, it's not obnoxious. a good video. It's not a hey, good it's video. It's like three minutes long, too. Yeah. She's the Roy Moore of Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, mean, I think that's she, I think that's accurate. Total embarrassment to the Republican Party, and I don't. I don't well, we'll talk with Gabe about the, who her opponent might be and what might happen down there. On your radio, on TV. 
and online. This is The Bill Press Show. Hey, on a Tuesday, October 10, uh, what do you say, everybody? Great to see you. The Bill Press Show with all the news of the day here from Washington, D.C., around the country and around the globe. Joining you on YouTube, youtube.com slash The Bill Press Show. Looking at you on Free Speech TV and right alongside of you in the greater Chicago area on WCPT, the progressive voice of Chicago. Here in studio with us in Washington from Politico, national political reporter Gabe DiBenedetti. Hi, Gabe, again. Great to see you. Still um, great to see you. Let's talk about this this Bob Corker flack, flap with the, uh, with the president. Um, he got some blowback yesterday from none other than Kellyanne Conway, who says, gee, for him to say these things about the president is so disrespectful. Here's a Kellyanne Conway. I find tweets like this to be incredibly irresponsible. It adds to the insulting that uh, the mainstream media and the president's detractors, almost a year after this election, they still can't accept the election results. It adds to their ability and their cover to speak about a president of the United States, the president of the United States, in ways that no president should. Nobody should ever speak of the president of the United States like that. But, of course, he can say anything he wants about anybody else, right? Well, uh, free speech questions aside, uh, which is not a a way that I like to start sentences, uh, (laughs) what we have to keep in mind here is that this this was a really remarkable thing for Corker to say. And so it's understandable that Republicans are surprised a bit taken aback. Corker is, uh, you know, this establishment figure in the Republican Party who was one of the first senators to really embrace Trump Thank last you. year. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. And an enabler, some people were calling it. Let's him. say validator. Uh, yeah. But okay. he certainly is someone yeah. who went around, you know, making sure that Trump was acceptable to the Republican uh, base uh, or, or Republican senators, establishment. establishment donors, what have you. For Corker to come out and say this, you know, a year later, what he said was, you know, the White House is an adult daycare center. Uh, Trump is going to start World War Three is extremely remarkable. And, it, you know, yes, Corker is retiring, but he has 16 months left and he's an extremely powerful senator on Capitol Hill. He runs the Foreign Relations Committee. So we have to understand that he wasn't just saying this because he's fed up with Trump. He's really trying to send a message, probably trying to get other lawmakers to say this publicly. And what you heard there from Kellyanne and what you hear from other uh, allies of the president. Mike Pence said the same thing yesterday. Absolutely. Well, they're rolling out a number of surrogates to basically say this is inappropriate. This guy has an agenda. Forget, you know, pay no attention uh, to the to the loud voice booming all over the place. Uh, So there's there's both of these teams have incentives that we have to pay attention to. But Corker is trying to send a clear message here. Wouldn't be surprised to hear him trying to get other senators on board. What does it mean for Trump's agenda in Congress? Well, the real question is, what does Trump's backlash towards Corker mean? Corker has actually gone along with what Trump's, Trump wants on the vast majority of things, as most Republican senators have. But what Trump has been doing is, and his, his surrogates have been doing, is really getting back at Corker, trying to say, you know, this guy, we, we're trying to get rid of him. He's useless. Trump really can't afford to lose more than two votes on anything yeah. to pass any legislation. He already right. has problems with Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, uh Rand Paul, John McCain, add Corker, who two months ago, no one would have said this would be a problem for him to that mix. And that's a huge problem for him if he's trying to pass more legislation, which obviously he is. Yeah. Um, it's it's fascinating to me that they have essentially given up on the repeal of Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act because they just can't get it done. So we're going to move on to something that we know we can get done, tax like reform. tax reform. And Trump shoots himself in the foot again. Well, and what, Again, I mean, not for sure, but like this doesn't look good. In terms of his legislation and what he's actually planning to pass, it's amazing that he hasn't been able to really get any of the big ticket items Nothing. done. Uh, but I think one thing that really gets missed in all this is the political side, which is if you had gone to any one of these red state Democrats who were up for re-election in 2018, just a few weeks ago, a few months ago, let's say, and said, you know, what are you expecting? They would have expected nonstop pressure from the White House, from their <laughs> constituents. But these folks, you know, Joe Manchin, Heidi Heitkamp, Joe Donnelly, Sometimes they feel like they have to show up on stage with Trump, and a lot of Democrats understandably don't like that. But these guys have faced no pressure whatsoever to break from the party on any of these things, and they haven't yet. So the the amount of uh, fighting within the Republican Party is remarkable, and the fact that that hasn't turned into real pressure on some of these red state Democrats who should be very vulnerable right now is similarly stunning. Right. 
Um, but it, it, and in terms of the political of uh, fallout too, I mean, it, it, you sort of indicated this, and I believe that Corker is only saying publicly what a lot of senators are saying privately or yeah. believe. Privately, Absolutely, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so by Trump going after Corker, he's alienating others as well. Right. And I think who don't like to see one of their colleagues treated that way. That's absolutely true. But I think what you're what you're also seeing is Team Trump is trying to push back with overwhelming force in a preemptive strike saying no one else better try and do what Bob just did. Corker's retiring. So he feels a decent amount of leeway to do this because he doesn't he's not going to run for reelection in a state that Trump is quite uh, popular in. Yeah. Um, but other folks don't have that don't don't have that uh, yeah. luxury, and so Trump is sort of saying, if you think that you're going to get reelected, don't come after me. Now, so do we assume then that Marsha Blackburn is going to be the next senator from Tennessee? I wouldn't go that far yet, but she's certainly the front runner. You know, Tennessee is a pretty Republican state yeah. these days. She is seems to be the choice of both the Republican establishment now that Bill Haslam, the governor, has said he's not going to run, uh, and the sort of let's say the Bannon wing. Uh, people really seem to like her within that part of the uh, political spectrum. Democrats do have some strong candidates out there. There's a there's a veteran lawyer named James Mackler who's the uh, sort of establishment pick, uh, and Democrats in Tennessee tend to like him. Tennessee has elected Democrats. Before, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and some hello, yeah, Al Gore. I, I remember that guy. Uh, <laughs> some people have tried to get Al Gore to look at running again. He's not going to do yeah. that. Uh, <laughs> some people have tried to get former Governor Phil Bredesen to run. He's not going to do that. Uh, but but it's you know if there is Peyton a, Manning exactly. Not, people are talking about Peyton Manning running. Not exactly a Democrat though. <laughs> no, no, not not even, not close. even a little bit. Uh, actually, Mike Pence met with him over the weekend. Um, oh boy! But. Uh, you know, to make a long story short, it's going to be a real long shot for Democrats there. It looks like Marsha Blackburn will be the uh, front, dominating front runner for now, let's say. Right. Uh, so uh, neighboring state, you were down last week with uh, in Alabama. I was right? indeed, yeah. I don't know if it's a neighboring state or not, but it's close enough. We're in the deep south, though, right? <laughs> uh, I don't know me, about the borders down there. <laughs> it's like Africa for me, the, the, the borders. Uh, uh, so D- Joe Biden went down for... Doug Jones. Yeah, right? uh, not a lot of not a lot of big name Democrats have gone to Alabama for Doug Jones. Uh, there's precisely one. Yes, <laughs> Joe Biden. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, part of that is that it doesn't really make sense for a lot of big name Democrats to go down there. Um, at least politically Meaning speaking, he doesn't have a chance. I didn't say that, uh, but he may not have a chance. I will. Uh, he, it, it's going to be an extremely long shot for him. You know, a lot of Democrats feel like if anyone's going to win, it's going to be this guy, Doug Jones, who is a civil rights fighter attorney who's very well known uh, across the state, running against Roy Moore, who is maybe the most controversial figure Alabama's seen in a generation or two. Uh, but the reality is that basically no national Democrat is popular at all in Alabama. Democrats don't win in Alabama anymore. Biden is a popular figure, but he's still very polarizing. Jones can't bring Obama down there. He's not popular at all. He can't bring any one of the Clintons down there. They're not popular at all. So the question is, who could he bring in to help him? It has to be someone like Biden. Now, we'll see if Biden goes back. They're actually longtime friends. But the message that Biden gave you know, when he spoke at this rally that I went to, which was a pretty well-attended rally, a thousand people showed up in the middle of a Tuesday, uh, you know, he basically said, listen, Doug Jones is not going to embarrass you. And uh, that... Is basically what it just boils down to. You know, it's it was really uh, interesting to me, which means that Roy Moore, yeah, that's, will that's that's exactly yeah, right. Count yeah. on count on it. Yeah, day one. I uh, I spend a lot of time in the south. I'm from South Carolina. I, I drive down there sometimes. Drive through North Carolina. Donald Trump won. I spend a lot of time in South Carolina. Donald Trump won. Um, and you don't see a lot of real excitement about Donald Trump's presidency. But about two months ago, three months ago now. I went to Birmingham, Alabama, because I got some family there. And they are very much on fire about the Donald Trump presidency. I saw more Trump's bumper stickers, more Trump yard signs still. I mean, people are still very, very, I mean, that is 100% Trump country. And this is one of the big problems that Jones has, which is that he really can't, I wrote I wrote about this a few weeks ago, but you know if he were going to get the national party behind him in a really robust way, and that means a lot of you know grassroots money and money from the DSCC and the DNC and all these institutions, he'd likely have to turn himself into some sort of anti-Trump firebrand. That doesn't work in Alabama. Yeah. Trump is still you know very very popular there. 
Roy Moore is not the most popular man on earth. But what we saw, what we've seen in other races, think, for example, of the special election in Georgia in June, is when you have someone, even in a slightly Republican area, when you have a Democrat start to talk badly about Donald Trump, is the Republican, the local Republicans get very defensive and they say, we may not love him, but you don't get to talk about him like that. Mm -hmm. And so what a lot of Democrats are worried about is that if Jones were to start going off against Trump, as opposed to going off against uh, Roy Moore, who's controversial in his own right, obviously, then you would see the Republicans coalesce around Moore, which is kind of the worst case scenario. But as you have pointed out before, in that race against Big Luther, Strange, Roy Moore was more Trump than Trump. I mean, Roy Moore was the Trump candidate. Whether or not Trump gave him his his endorsement, yeah. Roy Moore ran the Trumpier of the, of the two campaigns, I think, without a doubt. So... Yeah. And- and uh, so let's assume Roy Moore gets uh, elected, which is probably a pretty safe assumption, sadly. Um, he, <laughs> we were talking about he's going to embarrass you. Hmm. He's certainly not going to toe the Mitch McConnell establishment Republican line. I mean, his issues, right, are anti-abortion, uh, uh, school prayer, uh, the, 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 the it says social, things like homosexual activity should be illegal. Uh, which he told me at that f- famous interview in 2005, uh, comparing it to bestiality, not the only one to do so. I remember Pat Buchanan doing that. But my, I guess my point is the social war, the social wars are going to be back full bore with Roy Moore. He'll start them all. And, and any attempt that by Republicans say, let's focus on jobs, let's focus on the economy, so for some reason, you know, they're obviously uh, Mitch McConnell wants to have as big a Republican majority as possible. So he's going to be pulling for more here. His his uh, super PAC says they're behind more. Yeah. But more is not going to vote for Mitch McConnell in leadership elections. He's not going to do what <laughs> yeah. Mitch McConnell no. wants. Right. Let's not assume that we know that Roy Moore is going to be come into uh, D.C. if he wins and just start, you know, causing enormous chaos. But the reality is that this guy is not going to do whatever McConnell wants. You know, I, I noticed a few weeks ago, uh, MoveOn.org sent out a fundraising email, and the subject line was, imagine a senator worse than Ted Cruz. That's it. <laughs> and yeah. it was about Roy Moore. <laughs> and, you know, Cruz has sort of towed the party line for the last few yeah, months. Yeah. But you can imagine that if Moore is out there sort of saying, McConnell has to go, we're not going to listen to this guy, it's, it's not exactly going to force other people in line behind McConnell. And McConnell's already in a t- very tough position here because if you are a vulnerable senator like Jeff Flake or Dean Heller and you see that McConnell was not able to protect Luther Strange, you know, why are you going to just fall in line behind him? You are not sure what your primary voters want, but it's certainly not boring establishment republicanism. Right. Steve Bannon, um, who is, seems to be uh, delighting and stirring up trouble from the outside, uh, said yesterday that he thinks Corker should resign. Uh, immediately. But Steve Bannon, of course, supported Roy Moore against his former boss, Donald Trump, uh, who was supporting Luther Strange. Does Bannon have any juice outside of that? Are there any other candidates that he could be supporting who might have a chance? The big question with Bannon is what he's actually going to bring to the table. Uh, He has Breitbart, obviously, and he has a big name now and he can get on TV. The reality is that he's talking to candidates all over the country. He's talking to Chris McDaniel, who might uh, challenge Roger Wicker in Mississippi. He's talking to some people in Tennessee, just in case Blackburn doesn't pan out. Uh, You know, Utah, Wyoming. And what all of these places have in common is that there are Republican incumbents here. This is kind of a best case scenario for Democrats in the short run, which is total chaos in Republican primaries. Obviously, what might end up happening is the Bannonites like Roy Moore might end up actually winning these seats. Uh, but the, the, you know, the fact is that, yeah, he's trying to play in state after state after state. Uh, does he have any other? Does he have another Roy Moore anywhere? I mean, I know he's looking for somebody to run against Dean Heller, right? Against Jeff. Flake. That's right. And they found and they found people there. The the thing that we have to remember about Moore is that Moore is not a new creation, as you well know. Yeah, Moore has right. been around for a very long yeah, time. Yeah. And there's no one in Alabama that's better known than Roy Moore, except like Nick, Nick Saban. Saban. Exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, and he's not wow. about to run for Senate. You know? Right. So. Uh, the reality is that it would be very hard for Bannon to try and create another Moore. Uh, but Bannon got in at the right time with Moore and decided that and Moore you know, allowed him to. So, no, there are not any other people with 100 percent name recognition in their states. But there are people who were well known enough to cause real problems for uh, for the sitting senators. Look at Arizona, where Kelly Ward has run against Jeff Fl- uh, run against McCain last time, now mm-hmm. running against Jeff Flake. So people know who she is. Yeah. She may not be, uh, you know, the most popular person in the state. 
but she's not a nobody coming from nowhere. Right. Uh, California- well, the, the, one of the names that came up with this whole Steve Bannon recruitment issue in Colorado was Tom Tancredo. Yes. Which, exactly. like, holy cow. I, 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 I but- fully believe that Roy Moore will win in Alabama. I'm not so sure that Tom Tancredo, unless they've toned him down a little bit in a place like Colorado. That's that's what's going to be so interesting is all, all, this whole movement of, you know, these candidates are going to be so local, right. right? Like maybe they can win in Arizona. They can probably win in Alabama. Can they win in Colorado? If they start winning in Colorado. And this is why Democrats are kind of uh, happy in the short run, nervous in the long run, because yeah. they're very happy to have this chaos in these Republican primaries. Yeah, but yeah. the reality is that if Tom Tancredo is the Republican nominee for governor in Colorado, even if Jared Polis or whoever ends up being the Democratic nominee is seen as pretty strong going into the general election, no election in Colorado gets uh, gets determined by more than 10 points anyway. It's going to be close no matter what, and that means that Tom Tancredo is going to have a pretty good shot at being the governor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So I became the Democratic State Chair of California in 1993, Uh, and one of the reasons that I uh, decided to uh, go for that job was because Bill Clinton had just been elected president, and Dianne Feinstein and Barbara Boxer had just been elected to the United States Senate, and I thought, yeah, this is a good run. (laughs) All right, good time, good company to be in. Uh, Senator Feinstein announcing yesterday she's going to go for another six years. She's yep. 84 years old. Uh, what's that going to mean? What's your take on uh, – it's been, okay, 20 years since I was state <laughs> chair of California, so I'm not that plugged in anymore. What's your take on what that means? Will she have a primary? Uh, almost certainly someone's going to run against her. The question is basically how serious it is. There's been a lot of speculation around – well, first off, let's back up and say that she's the front runner right now to keep her seat, period. Yeah, I yeah. would be very surprised if she doesn't. Uh, and I think most people, even people who are going to challenge her, would be very surprised if she doesn't. Uh, but there has been a lot of chatter about people trying to run against her, particularly if she was going to retire, you'd see a ton of people flooding into that oh, seat. So the people were lined up. Right. Literally dozens of people yes. were jumped yes. into that seat. Yes. But because of California's top two system, where you're essentially almost certainly going to have two Democrats running against each other in November, it's going to be very hard to beat her. That said, with all of that said, there are going to almost certainly be some people running against her. One, there's been a lot of focus on Kevin DeLeon, who is the Los Angeles area uh, leader of the state Senate, almost certain to run if she hadn't run Still possibly going to run now. He hasn't. And very, very attractive guy. He's done a great job. I Absolutely. Think. Yeah. yeah. And he's a, you know, he's a very well spoken guy with a big public figure, got lots of big allies in California. He would cause Feinstein some trouble. Uh, another person who's looked at running, though, it's not yet clear if he would do it against Feinstein is uh, this uh, earned income tax credit activist named Joe Sandberg, who would be a self funder. Uh, he's gone around the state. He actually gave a big speech at Netroots over the summer, so he's trying to get a bit of support. Uh, the reality is that there are a lot of people out there who will try and jump in against her, and there's going to be a good deal of progressive energy going against her because a lot of people don't think that she's really been hard enough on Donald Trump. And that is the central issue here, not necessarily any of her policies, though obviously people have specific points that they can that they can fight her on there. Uh She's the front runner. There's going to be a primary challenge. The question that she and everyone else in California is asking right now is how serious that's going to be. Obviously, with the gubernatorial race going on right now, too, there are a number of really big statewide fights happening in California that uh, will tell us a lot about the future of the Democratic Party out there. Uh, you know, it's no, it's not new for uh, Senator Feinstein to have Democrats who are not entirely happy with who she is. Um just a quick a quick anecdote, which you've, you've probably heard before, but I was there when she spoke to the um, the state party convention uh, when she was a candidate for Senate. Um, and she mentioned that she was a supporter of the death penalty. And the place booed. This, this, this was a Democratic convention. They booed her. And, of course, she had her camera crew there. That's exactly... What she wanted, what her campaign manager wanted. Bill, forget his last name now. Shame on me. Uh, at any rate, and um, so she ran ads with Diane Feinstein. She's an independent kind of Democrat, right? And she won overwhelmingly. That was a very smart move on her part. Yeah, and I think what I disagreed with her position. <laughs> sure. Very smart move on her part. Yeah, and I, as and I said, now that California has this top two system where there will be basically everyone who's running in one primary and then the top two people 
run against each other in November, she can get more conservative Democrats, even some Republicans on her side, if that's what it's going to take. But it was very telling yesterday, as soon as she announced re-election early in the morning, like 7 a.m. California time, Kamala Harris, her, her colleague yes. in the Senate, who is not, they've not always been best of friends, Harris almost immediately jumped in with a statement praising her, supporting her for re-election, re and then within hours had sent out a pretty, uh, you know, wholehearted endorsement of a fundraising email for for uh, Feinstein. So basically saying, I represent the California establishment now too, uh, and we're not going to let you guys, you know, come and take her seat. Yeah, but Kamala uh, doesn't have a reputation as a great progressive either, right? She's, she is an establishment uh, d Democrat. But so this does raise the issue of the age issue. I mean, it's it's not only Diane. I mean, Jerry Brown's 79, yep. but he is termed out. So otherwise, he would probably go for a third term. Sure. Well, and I think, Di uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi is 77. Um, uh, uh, Joe Biden's what? I don't know. 74, I believe. Four, right. Yeah. You know, if you look at the leadership of the Democratic Party today across the board, Bernie Sanders, right? Even the new, refreshing Democrats like Bernie Sanders. Yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth <laughs> Warren is nearly Elizabeth so Warren. Elizabeth yeah. Warren is, is not much younger than Hillary was, right? right? So uh, is it time for the whole gang to step aside? Let's face it. There's a lot of good young leaders in the Democratic Party who <laughs> they just don't have any openings, right? If we want to look specifically at the Feinstein race right now, uh, and then we can talk more broadly about this, one of the reasons that she's getting a challenge in the first place is because there are so many people in California who would be running for statewide seats, but can't because- There uh, aren't any. Because there aren't any. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And so when you see someone like DeLeon potentially jump into this race, one of the reasons is because he- is termed out in the state Senate, and what's he going to do with himself, you know, after this? So we, we don't know if he's going to run. But looking at California, you know, Linda Sanchez, who is the number five mm -hmm. uh, Democrat in the House, said last week, maybe it's time for Pelosi and co. to go. Now, that is not something that you hear a lot from leadership, from within Pelosi's own leadership team. But the point is, yeah, listen, there is a massive generational shift that could happen in the Democratic Party if someone forced it. The question is what that's actually going to look like. This is uh, Linda Sanchez. I do think it's time to pass the torch to a new generation of leaders. Yeah, that was in C-SPAN last week, I believe. Right? That's right. But so it, it, we but, we can't keep looking to old names to lead the party. I no, mean, we just can't. But you know, there there was a time when the idea that somebody's eighty, other than Robert Byrd, I guess, is always an exception. The time that someone is, is eighty four would think about running for another term. Would, you would say no, no way, right? But if, uh, and but if you look, but today it's different. I mean, people are just talking about Bernie running. Bernie's talking about running again. Yeah. Joe Biden's definitely wants to run again. Did Bernie destroy the age issue? I don't think Bernie did. I think Donald Trump. Donald did. Trump. Donald yeah. Trump is seventy something. He is the himself. oldest president. No, that's thank right. you. That, yeah. that's, that's good. We forget about him, but he's seventy one now, yeah. right? And I think one of the things that yeah. people. That's right. And one of the things that uh, I think people underestimate here is. Feinstein was asked over and over and over, you know, you're you're kind of old, you know, don't you think you should retire? And she hated that question. Yeah. Understandably, she's still yeah. operating yeah. extremely effectively as a but, senator. Absolutely. And she's as sharp as ever. And, and there's no sign that she's slowed down at all. Nor has Bernie. That's right. <laughs> and, you know, nor have a lot of these people. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, part of this is just, well, the science has gotten better. It's easier to be effective <laughs> when you're older. Like, let's just be honest about that. Uh, but a lot of it is also just that this is where our politics are right now. Obviously, there's a lot of room for some young, energetic people to come in and say, I'm the new generation. Look to me. Barack Obama obviously was pretty good at that. Uh, you know, we've seen this happen before. But the other the other side of this is that, like, Democrats – have not yet shown uh, that that's actually what the voters want. They, they want something new. They want some new energy. There's no doubt about that. As Bernie showed last year, there's a lot of appetite for that. But that doesn't necessarily translate to we want someone who is physically younger. No. Uh, no, I, I think you're right. And Peter, you touched on it too. It's the ideas, Bernie's ideas, right, that carried. And it didn't matter how old he was. Right. People didn't say, oh, well, he's got a lot of good ideas, but he's too old. I well, don't want to and, listen to him. No, and, and they on turned the, out to the rallies. Totally. And again, on the other side, like they, the Pied they, Piper. While Donald Trump talked a lot about high energy, you know, the reason that people voted for him wasn't because of his age. He didn't say, "I have the experience." No. It was because he offered something new in the Republican primary. So, so we'll we'll see. I think there will be a challenge in the primary, and I think it'll be two top Democrats in California for sure. 
Uh, the Republican Party is extinct in California, for certainly for statewide. It won't, it won't be. A, and so, and and Diane will be the strongest candidate, and I'd say be reelected. I, I want to read a story here that's a little off topic, but it, it's it's right. a good story. Yes. Because Forbes magazine published this morning an interview with our president, Donald Trump, and he talked about the Rex Tillerson stuff, where last week we had the story that Rex Tillerson had called Trump a dep- moron. A moron. And that's the nicest way to put it. NBC, some, some sources at NBC News said they called him an effing moron, but a moron. So Trump says, <laughs> I think it's fake news, but if he did do that, I guess we'll have to compare IQ tests. Right. And I can tell you who is going to win. Who? (laughs) He doesn't answer that question. But Trump is now at a point where he's suggesting that he and his cabinet members take an IQ test to see who is smarter. And frankly, boy, would I love to see an IQ test from Donald Trump. Uh, I think... (laughs) I think the challenge really is to take uh, an adult behavior test. Yeah, right. Mm. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> I think Bob Corker would uh, would agree. Uh, yeah, all right. I mean, Rex Tillerson is a grown-up, whatever right. you think of it. He's a grown-up. Right. Donald Trump. Eh. Ah. But, but this, but, I mean, to, seriously, to come full circle, this is exactly what Corker was talking about. Yeah. When he said, you yes. know, it's, it, this is an adult daycare center and someone has to be looking looking after him at all times. Uh, you know, this it's this kind of thing that no what? other president would ever say. When was you know the last I... time you challenged someone to an IQ test? Ten? Right. <laughs> Ten years old? Well, I've never been the president. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's true. The, you know, since, obviously, he did not hold back at all in his personal attacks against Hillary Clinton, lock her up, lock her up, the whole thing. Um but since then, what's striking to me is that Donald Trump's the, the target of his attacks have been mostly fellow Republicans, members of his own cabinet, Jeff Sessions, Rex Tillerson, others, members of the John McCain, Bob Corker, you know, members of the Republican Senate, well, senators. What's going on? I mean, w- one thing that we know is that w- the part of the campaign that Trump enjoyed the most was the Republican primary. Uh, totally. Last year, yes. and so you know, he really thinks and s- seems to believe genuinely that he's most effective when he's fighting against his own party, when he's seen as the insurgent, when he's fighting against Democrats. That's sort of expected, right? He, the Republican president disagreeing with the Democratic Senate, but it's new, it's interesting. There are headlines that come from him fighting within his own party, and the reality is he's not a down the line Republican. He's totally. broken from them right. in issue after issue, policy after policy. He enjoys it, right? So. Um, Back in uh, last, what was it, November 20, right, uh, just after he'd been, he was a vice president-elect, Mike Pence went to Broadway to see Hamilton. And he was not necessarily universally warmly received. Uh, And when it was over, Mike Pence was asked about it on Fox News the next day, uh, and he kind of took the high road. Here he is. You know, when we arrived, we heard we heard a, a few boos and we heard some cheers. And I nudged my kids and reminded them that's what freedom sounds like. That's what freedom sounds like. And yet he went to a Colts game on Sunday, and there's somebody who's a couple of players, a few players who take a knee. Isn't that what freedom looks like? Uh, well, they had more padding on. It's hard to tell. You know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, obviously this is a you know a major question, and it the reality is that it looks a lot like Pence was, you know, doing this uh, for Trump. Trump knew that he was going to go to the game. It's sort of a stunt. Uh, he was there for two seconds. The reporters literally weren't even brought into the stadium with him because they, they were knew told, that he was going to leave. But they were told that he was going to leave early. Right. Yeah. Right. So it he, was all all planned ahead of time. But it was all planned ahead of time. It's easy, you know, it's easy to get caught up in the security costs, which were significant, and all of that. Uh, the reality is that this is the White House and elements of uh, Trump-aligned Republican Party. They're trying to start a, a, a culture war, culture let's say, war. that Overt. is, yeah. you know, that is uh, overtly helpful for them politically. And this is a fight that they're trying to drag Democrats into. Uh, I saw, I think it was on your site this morning, I'm not sure it was your story, a headline that, that some people are saying that Pence is uh, maybe damaging his own reputation 
by being such a toad here for Donald Trump. I'm, you know, again, a year ago he says, yeah, hey, people have a right to protest, right? They have a right to boo. Now this year he's say, like, oh, you know, walk the line or else. Well, well if we're going to make this a purely political uh, conversation about Pence's political future, there's no doubt this guy wants to be the president one day. I think he's essentially oh, said God. as much. Yeah. Uh, and the Trump administration has said that they intend to make Pence the president after Trump. Uh the, it's clearly a, a calculation that the Republican Party is still with Donald Trump, and it just makes sense. It wouldn't make sense for Pence to go around trying to break from Trump in all these different ways. Trump basically wouldn't have that. But maybe not, is there a difference between not breaking from Trump and 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 not being such a public ass kisser on every <laughs> issue? Uh, you know? There's of course there's a huge difference there. Yeah, uh, and I think one of the big things that I think we have to remind, remember here is that. Uh, this Pence stunt happened the same weekend as the Corker stuff. So th- yes. th- there are two different models here of people who six months ago, nine months ago, would have been thought of as the establishment Republicans going drastically different directions. Uh, and, you know, I think it's worth watching what Pence does from here on out. Right. Well, it's too bad that uh, there's nothing going on, so you have nothing to report about, Jake. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's a tough time. <laughs> it is a full, t- full tilt boogie here on the political front. Nobody covers it better than you. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Dave DeBenedetti at Politico, politico.com. Of course, take a quick break. and We'll be back with Olivia Nutzi from uh, New York Magazine. You've described Trump as a clear and present danger to the U.S. Is he the most dangerous president you've ever had? I think he is because he is impulsive. He lacks self-control. He is uh, totally consumed by how he is viewed and what people think of him. He is vindictive get social with bill press like us at facebook.com slash bill press show this is the bill press show hey friends it's bill press here and i want to tell you about an exciting new venture that we're embarking on here at the uh, bill press show and ask for your help first i don't have to tell you with donald trump in the white house it's more important than ever to keep strong progressive voices out there on the media every single day but you know what it's also harder than ever for a couple of reasons first because there are so few progressive radio stations second because station owners just won't put progressive voices on the air and third because even youtube won't allow any ads on political on commentary, progressive commentary that's in any way political. I mean, you can't even mention the word war without YouTube pulling that ad revenue. And of course, without those ads, without that revenue, we can't raise the money we need to, um, you know, pay the rent, to pay salaries, to turn on the lights, and keep those strong progressive shows coming your way every every day as we have for the last twelve years. So. We've embarked on something new, and we need your help. We've just started putting up all exclusive content on a new platform called Patreon. Now, by becoming a Bill Press Show subscriber for a very low monthly fee, you'll be able to go to Patreon and get exclusive content, newsmaker interviews, political, progressive commentary, political columns that you won't be able to get anywhere else. And pretty soon, you'll be able to enjoy our very special podcast called The Making of Bernie Sanders. And again, it's all on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. So please go to Patreon today and sign up, become a subscriber uh, to The Bill Press Show. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we will keep the resistance alive. Together, We will fight back against the destructive policies of Donald Trump, but we can't do it without your help. So please go to Patreon today and sign up. Thank you. Look at you. You're at the top of your game. At work or at play, you're unstoppable. Nothing can throw you off track. Oh, hey, she's cute. Nice going, man. Things are going great for you. You've earned a night out. Good drinks, good friends. Yeah, Yeah. we can go ahead and call this a good night. Wait, is that your car? Uh Uh-oh, not smart. Yeah, I saw that coming. Say goodbye to her. Ouch, that'll hurt your bank account. You're looking at around 10 grand in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. I hope you like eating frozen dinners alone. Let's try this again. 
smart move. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Live video, Bill's commentary, the best clips from the show, all in one place. YouTube.com slash The Bill Press Show. Hey, you got it on a Tuesday, October 10, The Bill Press Show, live from Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. Brought to you today by the International Association of Iron Workers. Yep, good men and women of the Iron Workers Union under President Eric Dean building our communities today and ready to rebuild America's infrastructure tomorrow. Check out the website at ironworkers.org. Uh, I see you down at the White House covering uh, the the briefings and uh, talking about politics, uh, national politics in general. Olivia Nutzi here from New York Magazine. Hi, Hi. Olivia. Nice to see you. Nice to see you both. It's, hey, nice, hey. it's uh, nice to see you, but very nice to see Peter. <laughs> yes, indeed. Glad to, have, glad to have Peter back. I tell everybody now, having spent uh, part of the year in a coma, I got to say, Coma's not so bad. Not so bad. <laughs> Coma's not so bad. You know how many news yeah. cycles I missed? It was great. I had an ear infection a few weeks ago, which you can get as an adult. I had no idea. And I couldn't hear for like four days. And I much prefer it. What a blessing. I really prefer it. Yeah, I no. think not having some of your, your faculties <laughs> is good in 2017. <laughs> it's the only way to survive the Trump presidency. Seriously. Perhaps, right. I was intrigued by your interview with... The Roger Stone, the, the famous Roger, Roger Stone. who came here yeah. to testify in front of the Senate, was it, or the House Intelligence Committee? I forget. Um, I I'm pretty sure it was the Senate. But, but, but about the to, Russian, it was like a week ago. About the Russian probe. So did he admit that he's behind all the Russian hacking and helped them out? Yeah, uh, he admitted to all of that. Um, actually, he is Putin closed. in a in a Roger Stone suit. Uh, <laughs> um, he, um, you know, so what, uh, Roger is a you know, I, he's someone that I'm so. Um, I'm happy to be alive while he's still alive because he's so fascinating and he just pops up literally everywhere. I mean, anytime there is anything interesting happening in politics, especially if it's politics in, you know, the Northeast Corridor, um, he's there lurking someplace or he pretends like he's been lurking there. Um, every deck, <laughs> every decade, Roger Stone has had like no, he's been around yeah. forever. A mm -hmm. thing like right. the whole idea of packs and super packs were sort of invented and created by. Roger Stone. I can't think of him without seeing the Nixon, the tattoo. Nixon tattoo. I got oh, him to show that to me in a restaurant once <laughs> in New York. You like? <laughs> Wait, in a restaurant? It's pretty years far ago, down his back. No, it's like, like, like no. right. Oh, it's like yeah, right in the yeah, middle yeah. of his back. It's sort of like Did by the shoulder blades, off? not all the way off. <laughs> no, not all the way off. Um, but he's <laughs> fascinating, and you know, the first time that he testified to Congress was during the Watergate hearings. So it's like it's incredible that he's now part of this. Decades later. Well, he travels with his own colorist? I'm not clear if they are a traveling show, the two of them, but he did certainly uh, get his hair colored, he said, the morning of the, the testimony. Because he is, like me, not naturally blonde or whatever color he is. And uh, he has to get his roots done a lot. So. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't this nice? Is Roger, yeah. He focuses so much on... His look and his fashion. Yeah, well, more than I would say any other Republican. He called yeah. for a boycott of me this week. I don't really know why. Um, but oh. so I, I mean, he was he seemed fine with me when I was one of the only journalists yeah. who was trying okay. to interview so him that night. So how much of how much of Roger Stone is fake and how much is he really an advisor to Donald Trump? Well, you know, at I, all is he plugged in at all? Or he is. is. He just... Yeah, they. I think to the extent that Donald Trump has any friends Roger Stone would probably count among them um, you know he he's pretty honest when he discusses how often they talk I think obviously it behooves him to have this mystique yeah. around him that you know they're very close and, and he maybe can can influence the president's actions but I think that they do speak but it, with Donald Trump it's like you know he calls you you're kind of at, yeah. you know at his disposal and you just have to live with that. And I think there's always some some bitterness or some resentment there. Remind um, me, did he actually have a position in the campaign? He did. So he um, 
depending on who you believe, he was either fired or he quit the campaign. Early this was on. in August 2015, very early yeah. on, because yeah. he began the campaign June 16th, 2015. Not that it's like burned right. into my memory or anything. <laughs> and uh, and uh, when Sam Nunberg was fired from the campaign for um, Facebook posts mm-hmm. using racist slurs, um, Roger Stone claims that he then wanted to exit with him because Nunberg was like his protege. Oh, yeah. uh, but Trump has always claimed that he fired him. So it's like, who who do you believe in that scenario? <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, is he? I really don't know. I don't that's know. A real, like, I really that's a really know. tough question. Uh, is he a target in the investigation uh, in terms of his role? Because he admits that he... Talk to would Lucifer two or God, what was it? Lucifer two. Lucifer. <laughs> yeah. He's the one yeah. who led on yeah. that uh, Lucifer two was was a lady. Yeah. Everybody just yeah. sort of identified yeah. Lucifer as. So my understanding as, as is that he he produced a lot of documents like that uh, relating to that for the committee. Um, I mean, he does seem to be part of the probe. Certainly, he's a longtime confident confidant of uh, of Paul Manafort. They had this this lobbying firm. You remember right. here in the eighties. Um, with Charlie Black, and Manafort, he was sort of the one that brought Manafort into the fold. I think I don't know that Donald Trump knew Paul Manafort, you know, independent mm-hmm. of Stone. Um, so he's certainly part of it. I mean, he he's very bitter about this whole thing. Obviously, uh, he's he seems very angry that people think that he was speaking directly uh, to WikiLeaks. He claims that he had an intermediary now. Um, but you know, he's always lurking everywhere, including in the Russia probe. So. <laughs> I, I just wonder if he's been identified as a person of interest, or whether people just I don't know see him on as uh, on the sidelines. But. I, in the Mueller, I mean, I, I don't know. It's not clear to me. I think obviously Paul Manafort is like the big fish that yeah. they're trying to get, but um, I I wouldn't be surprised if he were also a target. But I, I couldn't speak definitively about right. that. Uh, in terms of people who've been fired, uh, Tom Price, the more <laughs> most recent one, yeah, uh, probably not the last one of the Trump cabinet to be fired. Yeah. <laughs> Rex Tillerson is maybe on the short leash as well. Uh, you've written your headline, The Strangely Normal Exit of Tom Price. Mm-hmm. What was normal about it? He did something unethical, and then there was outrage, and then he faced consequences. And that almost never happens in Trump's orbit, right? Nobody faces con- consequences for anything, Yeah, uh, usually. So it, it was extremely normal. I think it's because you know with Donald Trump, you can do a lot wrong if you are in good standing with him. Tom Price was not in good standing with him. Because he lost the repeal? Yeah. He's but, got to blame it on somebody yeah, other than himself. Yeah, exactly, because God forbid he look inward. Um, <laughs> remember but, that one time Trump said, you got the votes, you have the votes. If not, you know, you're yeah, fired. Yeah, yeah, I mean, by the end of the year, it's going to be just like me and Bill roaming around the White House <laughs> with, like, some interns or something. Yeah. <laughs> no one's going to be left. <laughs> but the thing that, that, that I remember so, about... Trump, his outrage at Price, he said, was over the optics. It wasn't right. that what Price did was wrong. Right. But even but that is optics. normal. Even that's normal because yeah. how often does Trump care about optics in a traditional right. sense? Right. Well, right. when it makes him look bad, he cares about it. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, how often has that happened? Very, very rarely. He can always find someone to throw it off onto. That's, right. that, that is Trump's real skill. Is to avoid any kind of actual, but like, and the other reality that we yeah. discovered here is that Tom Price was hardly alone among cabinet members who seemed to be abusing right. uh, corporate jets, right? Right. It's not about the issue own... of abusing corporate jets. It's the issue of Tom Price was not somebody who was sanctioned to abuse anything yeah. because he yeah. was not in good standing with the president. Right. I think part of the the, the normal aspect of this too is like. Just what is normal now, and how different normal is mm-hmm. than what it was four years ago. Like if if one of Obama's cabinet members did what Tom Price did, like we would never stop talking. Oh about no, it. and like Fox News would be just wall to wall coverage of like you know the lavish spending ways of these. These hip hop I mean, secretaries forever, or something like that. For, like, for, you know, forever, like, it, it would be, be. It would never ever ever. No. And, and then Tom Price got fired. On a Friday, by Monday, we had six other things to talk about. Oh yeah, I mean, but it would just it would it would follow the Obama it would have followed the Obama administration forever. Forever, it would have defined them according mm-hmm. to the right. 
Right. But we're going to forget about this in like a week. Now, you may, wonder why we, yeah. you may wonder why we invited you in today. We invited you in because we need the final word on who is the real first lady of the United States. Um, oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I'm like, <laughs> I'm so annoyed. Now, I'm annoyed. Ivana, <laughs> Ivana Trump appeared, as so we great. know, on Good Morning America yesterday, and she she surprised everybody by making a very bold uh, assertion. Ivana the number one a wife of Donald Trump and Ivanka's mommy, right? Yeah, that's Ivanka's mother. Ivanka's mommy. Okay. And Eric and Don Jr. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. Eric, and Eric and Don Jr. That's right, that's right, that's right. Because he didn't have any kids with Marla Maples. Right. Well, no, no. Did he? Tiffany, Tiffany. Oh, Tiffany was with Marla? Oh, my God. Oh, man. I forgot that was Tiffany. So mean. I'm that sorry. Was I honestly really forgot mean. about Tiffany. No, no, no. Everybody forgets about Tiffany. I know. I feel oh, bad. She is. She wow. is the forgotten Trump. She is. Yeah, no, no I, 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 I mean, I feel bad about it, but it's not like she has any, like, she's not out there. Like, like the Is she okay? Yeah, we yeah. haven't heard from her in a while. Is all she all right? right? She's at Georgetown. She's studying yeah. oh, okay. know, she's studying right. law or, or is she undergrad? No, law school. Law school, yeah, yeah. So anyhow, Ivanka, Ivana yesterday, Ivana. who has a book called Raising Trump. Right. Uh, <laughs> and here she is on Good Morning America. I have the direct number to White House, but I don't really want to call him there because Melania is there, and I don't want to cause any kind of jealousy or something like that oh because God. I'm basically first Trump wife, okay? <laughs> I'm first lady, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, if, it, as if that's not bad enough, Melania had to respond. Did well, she have to? <laughs> well, no, she didn't have to. She didn't to. have to, she but she did. She had to. What did she say? You've got it here again? Mrs. Yeah. This is what Melania's office said yesterday. Mrs. Trump has made the White House a home for Barron and the president, <laughs> which is hilarious. She loves living in Washington, D.C. and is honored by her role as First Lady of the United States. She plans to use her title and role to help children, not to sell books. There is clearly no substance to this statement from an ex- this is unfortunately only attention-seeking and self-serving noise. Because she's out there trying to sell this book, Raising yeah, Trump, yeah. as you mentioned, yeah. which is where she kind of takes credit for raising the Trump children, which, by the way, not really a brag. If you've ever read any of their tweets or seen them in person or try and speak, like, I wouldn't want to well, take the, the ownership the of those The bar for the Trump kids is so low. Because yeah. everyone's always like, they're so great. He raised these great children. It's like... In the sense that they're like not in prison yet, or like, <laughs> like they're not in jail at all. They don't have any drug problems that we know about. Yeah, like he did a great job, but the bar <laughs> is super low. We don't know That's anything. That's not supposed about to them. happen. Yeah, like it's not like they seem like you know very evolved, uh, kind people or something like that. None of them can strange. spell. I doubt any of them know how to read. <laughs> uh, like. Uh, it's like that old Chris Rock bit, like the guys that walk uh, around bragging, like, I take care of my kids. <laughs> You're supposed to take care of your kids. That's a very low bar. But, you know, Bill, <laughs> you were in, you were quoted in my profile of Kellyanne Conway, the title of which on the cover was the real first lady of Trump's America. Mm. Mm, yeah. It's like, oh, so there, there are... is a, an all out, oh. you know, multi prompt <laughs> yeah. war I going thought... on here. Right. How many first ladies are there? Yeah. I mean, I guess. Ivana is the first uh, wife, so that's the the first for no. No. When was has there ever been an ex-wife? Yes. Ever President Reagan. Yes. Reagan. Reagan. Yeah, Reagan. Jane Wyman. Yeah. Jane Wyman. Right. So. Yeah. And I Jane know. Wyman. I think she might have been dead at the time, but I know. And certainly, she didn't claim to be the first lady. <laughs> I don't think there was a fight over. We'll the have first to go lady. back to yeah. see when she died. Melania. Uh, she I feel a little bad for Melania here, though. Like, can she just have this one thing? Like, yeah, right. You know? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I certainly think her office should have just ignored oh, what Ivana yeah. said. I mean, you know. I never would have heard about what Ivana said if Melania hadn't responded to think, it. Right. Everybody would have taken it just as a joke, yeah. which I think is how she meant it, obviously. She's very funny. If you go back and watch interviews with her, even from back in the day, she's a funny woman. Ivana, Melania, I don't think, has a sense of humor. No, no, no. I don't think she has any emotions or feelings at all. We haven't seen any evidence of it, have we? No, I, I'm not trying to be funny. I just, like, you watch, like, the other day, her husband was up there mocking the pronunciation of Puerto Rico. Did you see that? I mean, his wife, who who English is not her first language, I'm not, I'm not making fun yeah. of her, but, like, he's up there mocking the way that people say, Puerto Rico. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, you, your wife doesn't, I mean, 
English is her second language. She speaks with a heavily accented He's English. You gotta make fun of her at home. Oh, right? you know it. Like, you know it. Definitely. Yeah. Right. Uh, so the other thing in it, 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 New York Magazine, uh, one of the uh, big uh, um, players in New York, Harvey Weinstein. Oh boy. Uh, no longer with the Weinstein Company, uh, as we know. Mm -hmm. um, You're saying uh, he's just a big player in New York? Well, no, no. But from New York, but big player nationwide, for sure. And and he and Trump, I'm sure, were buddy-buddy. And maybe they had more than one thing in common. Now, I think we do know now they have more than one thing in common. One thing in common. They're not both, they're both successful businessmen. They're also uh, serial sexual harassers, if not abusers. Um, so the issue yesterday comes up on CNN mm -hmm. when the national chair of the Republican, the Republican National Committee chair, Rona Romney, McDaniel, right? Like Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Oh, God. They have to keep their daddies <laughs> alive, <laughs> right? So she is uh, defending Donald Trump, uh -huh. but attacking Harvey Weinstein, saying right. there's a big difference. Right. Here she is. It's Tape not again. even comparable, though. I mean, I, Harvey Weinstein brought women into his hotel rooms. I mean, to say, to even make that comparison is a disrespectful to the president. He didn't have eight settlements. He didn't have women coming forward saying what Har I mean, Harvey Weinstein who, admits uh, that he did that. It, but I want to just point out, Rana, there were plenty of women who came forward and made accusations against then private citizen Donald Trump. But, so it was okay for Donald Trump, mm -hmm. but not okay for Harvey Weinstein. Right, well, that's the rule with Donald Trump always, no matter yeah. what it is. But, I mean, for him to have commented on this like he did the other day, the like the lack of self-aware, you have to be so far out to yeah. think that it's okay and that nobody's going to say anything about your own behavior to comment on that. And it's like, is, is he, does he not, uh, I can't curse on this, does he not <laughs> care or does he? is he so confident that nobody else will ever care? That he can do that. I think it's probably a combination of the two, but it's it's well, this false equivalency and, and it's yeah, so bizarre. Yeah. But I mean, I think Donald Trump has reason to believe that nobody cares. Oh yeah. Look where he is. Exactly. I mean, nobody else could have had the Access Hollywood tape released and right. still be a well, candidate of a major political totally. party, let alone president of the United States. And this States. is the thing with, uh, I think, what Roger Stone was calling on a boycott of me over, because I, I mentioned <sighs> that, um, you know, Trump has been accused of rape, sexual assault, or sex sexual misconduct over a dozen times. I think it's 14 times. Um, he was accused once by Ivana. Um, uh -huh. she, yeah. Later, yeah. she later said that she later right. recanted, but that's very common with rape, sure. vi mm -hmm. rape victims. Um, and he, and he, Roger Stone called me and said I was lying or something like that, as if the accusations were in public. But the thing is, he admitted to behavior like that on the record. We all yes, heard it. Yes. So it's like, why would we think that the other accusations, which sound, frankly, a lot like what he had admitted to on the record on that tape, would be out of the realm of possibility? Of course it's within the realm of possibility. Of course it is. Yeah. 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 And if it wasn't right for Roger Ailes or Bill O'Reilly or Harvey Weinstein, it right. wasn't right for Donald Trump either. Right. I mean, duh. duh. Yeah. End of story. <laughs> Boycotting you? No. I want you to know. He made a hashtag. Did he really? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we wouldn't want anybody to boycott you. We love you, Olivia. Thanks so much for doing Thank what you you're for doing and for coming in, keeping on top of it. I'll see you down at the White House. Yeah, it's just going to be us. You and I can. <laughs> yes. You're all that's left. And I can take Sarah on. Okay, here we go. That's it for the show of this Tuesday. The rest of the day is yours. Enjoy it. Come back and see us again this tomorrow. This is The Bill Press Show.